Um, the guys did such a great job last night on the post game show. Uh, Mark Farsetta was there with the guys. He was sitting on the desk. And I'll tell you what, this is like Bison Row this week. I got Tony Bruno in like hour number two at 4 30. And I mean, we've had Miss Anelli on, we've had Angelo on this week. Why not add another Paisan to it here? Pasa Vazul for everybody. Mark Farsetti joins us now. <laughs> <laughs> this yellow, is Pasa Vazul for everyone here. Yellow Pasa Fajoli, yellow Pasa Fajoli over there. Hold on. <laughs> Let me just act like I already had my Pasa Fajoli. Hold on one second. All right. There we go. Tell oh, me that's okay. cappuccino, please. A cappuccino. I got a little espresso. After 11, <laughs> what am I, a barbarian? Drinking hey, cappuccino wait, later? Wait. Come on. Hey, if, if you have cappuccino, this doesn't this have to go up? <laughs> <laughs> now, what am I, French? Come on now. You know what I'm saying? No, I just stays yeah, down like a man. More than Italians. All right, Mark. Give me your <laughs> give me your take. Give me your takeaway from last night's game. Uh my takeaway is Brian Johnson's got a lot of ish to figure out. Look. Uh, we, uh, Mike Vicinelli asked a question on the post game last night and we went around the horn and just said, you know, your, your concern level. And Seth was at like a seven in terms of like, you know, 10 is the most worried. I think uh, Gunner was at a six. I'm honestly at a four. I'm at a four. I'm not overly concerned. It's two games in a five day span to start off with. And I love your phrase training wheel coordinators. Uh, I've been overall impressed with what I've seen from Sean Desai. Certainly have seen more aggression from Sean Desai than I saw from Jonathan Gannon at the time here. Um, I think I have seen a tremendous effort and production from Josh Sweat. Five quarterback hits in the game last night. Uh, but when it comes to everything else, I am I, I do have worry uh, about uh, Jalen Hurts if he doesn't take a huge step forward uh, two Sundays, well, exactly a week from the, this coming Monday when they take on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, I think you have to look at this game, these first two games of the season when it comes to Jalen Hurts and Brian Johnson. As their, um, as A.J. Brown put it after the Patriots game, uh, it was a learning experience. It was a teaching moment, and I hope they learn from it and improve because they simply they have to. Uh, Jalen Hurts' throw, his interception, was atrocious. And this is the thing, Dan, I don't know if you ever heard me say this, but I always like to say, sure, numbers don't lie, but they sure as hell can deceive. And if you look at Jalen Hurts' numbers, 18-23 to 23 in last night's game, you would go, oh, it was a pretty good game. Um, that interception was horrifying. His reads were not there. If it's not, if it's him and Brian Johnson simply not being on the same page and not understanding the overall offensive philosophy and the change from uh, Shane Steichen to uh, Brian Johnson, then they got the next uh, week plus to figure it out and get on the same page. And I know that they've known each other and everyone told me, oh, there'll be no uh, issue with the transition from Brian Johnson and uh, Shane Steichen. Uh, Brian Johnson has no Jalen Hurts since he was four years old. I'm like, yeah, but he hasn't been calling plays for Jalen Hurts since he was four years old. So for me, that is the thing that needs to be ironed out the most over uh, the distance they have between games here. Do you think they took the ball out of Jalen's hands after that pick? Because they see, and again, if it's not for the turnovers with the Vikings, Mark, I mean, the Vikings were running all over that field in the passing game. And I mean – what's his name at 150 what was it had 150 some odd yards receiving the other receiver had a really great game as Justin well Jefferson, here. Yeah. Atkinson, um Jordan Addison also they were running all over or they were throwing the ball all over that that you think they decided to go like this let's get time in possession let's not throw the ball and get three and outs because I'll say this to you too Mark Hertz is getting hit more he's getting hit more and so when you see them at pass probe, I personally don't think the old line's doing that great a job. Their forte's running the ball. It's really not pass protection because that kid's getting hit more. And to me, they just went – that's why you saw Lane go like this. Let's yeah. keep it going. Let's keep it going. I think he wanted – they wanted to do that until they, like you said, can figure this out. Yeah, uh, Lane Johnson's done that before with the Eagles. I remember he did it with Doug Peterson against the Giants a few years ago where he's like, hey, look, we're we're doing well with this. Let's just keep this going. And they ended up winning that football game. Um, Lane Johnson will do that, and I, I love that he does that. This Eagles offensive line, when it comes to running the football, they could just bully teams, absolutely bully teams. And when you look at what they did last night, 13 of 16 plays on that drive were run plays. You like you don't you don't see that in the NFL, Dan. You don't see that anymore. And the Eagles, they can do that. And it's amazing to me and, and I, I know people don't like this, but I like when teams find ways to win. 
And if your team finds a way to win, that means that overall, it means you're a pretty good team if you could find a way to win. For the Eagles to be able to shift into another dominant form of offense, whether that be pass or run, in this case run, then damn it, you shift into that. And that's what they did last night against the Minnesota Vikings. And I think going into this game, the run game had to be a big factor in winning it. Not because I think Jalen Hurts all of a sudden sucks or he can't play anymore and last year was an anomaly and he'll never be a, an MVP candidate again. I think he will be. But in this first two weeks of the season, there's been struggles. And I think in this particular game against the Vikings with so many members of your secondary out and having guys like Justin Jefferson and – look, Kirk Cousins is not going to the Hall of Fame, okay – but he can pick a defense apart. He can be well, extremely he's gonna go accurate. To the fantasy, he's going to go to the fantasy oh. football hall of fame. Oh yeah. I totally, I totally agree with that. Uh, so you had to keep their receivers off the field. And the way you do that is like you said, you go to time of possession, you go to uh, manage the clock. And that's what they did when they ran the ball 13 to 16 times and had such great success in doing it. So that to me changed the entire flow of the game. Obviously the fumbles had a big part of that, but you know, the Eagles were making plays on special teams as far as that concerned uh, before Avante Maddox got hurt. He forced that great fumble. Um, they were they were really taking advantage of that as far as the turnovers went. But I tip my hat to the Eagles and being able to create those turnovers. But yes, when it came to the run, I think they said, all right, less is more from a passing game standpoint at this point. So Brian Johnson and Jalen Hurts need to get on that same page and figure it out over the next couple of days here before they come back against the Bucs. I, I, I want to throw this at you here. Um, why is it so important for the, uh, the organization – to have it so that Jalen Hurts is being trans... Here, I, I, I say this to people all the time about broadcasters like you and me. You get hired from a place. The first thing you do is the program director goes in and says, hey, I got a great idea to change your show. I'm going to add this. We got a nice benchmark for you. How about a partner over here you never met? You know what we... Is? And you're going like this. Well, why the hell did you hire me? Right. I mean, what you do is you try changing who you are. I get a sense when I'm watching what they're trying to do offensively, they're kind of trying to change who Jalen – he's a power-running quarterback. He's the greatest Wildcat runner who can throw in the history of the league. He's unique. He's got a unique skill set. The things that they're trying to do in Chicago, Mark, they want that kid Fields to look like the kid in Philly because there's one of. You can't defend – you just said it. Hey, that guy can go from this to this. Well, Patrick Mahomes can't do that. He can't go from this to this. He can't. So why is the organization so like hell bent on trying to make him a drop back quarterback? I mean, dude, play who he is. Mm. Let him be Jalen Hurts. And I think that's the difference between Shane Steichen and Brian Johnson. I think they're trying to force the ball down the field too much here. Let Jalen eat. Hmm. Yeah, I I love one of the things I heard from Nick Sirianni uh, in the in the off season, uh, I should say in the preseason, talking about how why would they want to take away something that Jalen Hurts does great? Okay, so that's what they said. But what I've seen, it hasn't been that. It has been more along the lines of trying to get him to throw the football now. You could say that it is bastardizing his game and it's taking away what he does so well and trying to force him to do something else. But I think he can throw the football well. I think he can be accurate. We saw it last year. I think he can read a defense. It's a matter, I think, of your offensive coordinator and your coaching staff putting him in the best possible position to make those plays and make those throws. I like what Jalen Hurts had to say, and I still see it from Jalen Hurts. He likes to embrace the uniqueness of his game. That's what he said this preseason. I still believe he's trying to do that. I think the coaching staff is trying to steer him in a different direction. If the overall goal, Dan, is to be able to keep him safer, and I understand that guys get injured in the pocket too, but if he cannot take that big hit, if he cannot get all the weight on him like he did in Chicago that knocked him out of a couple of games last year, if he can avoid that injury by being able to sit in that pocket and deliver the football with great timing and accuracy and do it in a timely fashion, well, then that's going to keep him on the field more. I would like Jalen Hurts to play every game this year, and I still think the Eagles have a phenomenal shot of making it to the Super Bowl, and I think Jalen Hurts is going to bounce back from two rough games of the season with this team still being 2-0, and but you still have to embrace that uniqueness of his game, and I think ultimately – the biggest problem in what we have seen so far this season is he is – for everyone that wanted to scream and yell about him being a one-read wonder last year and everyone wanted to you know sling that mud at him, he's been that so far this year. Now, 
here's the saving grace of that. Um, obviously, no preseason play. Uh, I think I think uh, Nick Sirianni is going to be walking that back pretty soon about having his starters play in the preseason. But uh, he played against Bill Belichick, and then he played against the disciple of Bill Belichick. All right, so those are two good defenses. And if they're not good defenses, they're certainly good schematic defenses where they can take away certain things. So I think one was a copy of the other. Now you have some time to rest, get to the drawing board, figure it out, and then come out hopefully swinging. But what I saw from Jalen Hurts so far in the first uh, two games of the season, yeah, it's not the guy that I saw last year. I think a lot of that comes down to coaching, and maybe that coaching is getting inside his head a little bit where he's going to start to take himself away from the uniqueness of his game. Also, you know, hey, man, calling me crazy would be uh, like an understatement, so it's all good. I get it here, but – and I'm a big conspiracy theory guy, so you you can – nah, that's crazy, so it's all good. But is it me? But in the first game I'm watching, I saw him sliding before the guys were coming up onto him, and I saw him protecting himself more, and I go, you know, probably just one time. But I saw it four times. Yeah. And then last night, I also saw it a little bit that maybe the coaches are telling him, hey, look – we need you to play on month. We need we need you to we need you to play in the next play. So I mean, am, am I wrong, Mark? Am I seeing that a little bit that he's like it's like self preservation? I mean, I I don't I, I don't know if they're telling him that because he didn't play that way last year. I'm not he's not reckless like the guy in Buffalo or the guy in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. But he just seems like I don't know. It, it looks like some business decisions going on there. I'll, I'll put it to you like this. It definitely raised my eyebrows in the first quarter, first possession. They throw the ball down deep to Devontae Smith. Um, he gets rid of the ball early, underthrows it a little bit, but still made the play in a pass rush coming in his face. DeAndre Swift did a good job of at least getting this blitzer off, off his mark uh, or off his route. Um, and the play after that, I think it was, he had a run to the right where he tried to cut up field as opposed to just taking it outside. And it looked like he was just trying to get down. Um, shortly after that, I think it was their second possession of the game. He had a play where he was rolling to his left and he saw the pressure and just kind of went down and took a knee and ended up still getting hit. And then in the pocket, when it started to collapse on him a little bit throughout the game, you saw situations where instead of trying to fight, um, for a yard or to extend the play, he just went down. I don't business decision for your quarterback. I'm fine with if it's a wide receiver saying he's not going to go up and try to contest for a ball then I have a problem with it. But when it comes to Jalen Hurts. Maybe that is part of that whole trying to take the uniqueness of his game away. Uh, that was something that I did notice. I don't think you're crazy at all. It did look like I, I don't want to say like gingerly or overly cautious. I, maybe business decision was a bad phrase, but yeah. I, it just seems that you know they're he's aware of it. He's, so like, he's aware of more it. awareness of it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I agree. I would agree with that. I I don't see him playing timid. I don't see no, him playing no. scared. No. But I think it, to, I think what you what I think you're trying to convey. And I don't want to put words in your mouth. I, I would put it more along the lines of the awareness of injury, which does trouble me. Yeah. Because you can't – you I mean, you play – you know the deal. No, no, it's two years in a row he hasn't finished the season or he's yeah. missed some games in a season. Yeah. And I think what you're saying, Mark, they want him to go 17. Yeah. Because they know they're going to need him. So I think – I do think that's a, 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 an issue. I got to say this to you now. A.J. Brown and, and uh, Jalen on the sidelines – you know, I don't want so I I don't I don't want to like I like to do with people. I don't want to like lead you to uh, the trough here on this. Let me give yeah. your thoughts first and foremost on it. What was your takeaway on that exchange? Uh, it sucks in today's world. It's like it's not so much what's going on because I believe right then and there they're competitors. Everybody wants to help everybody. It didn't look ridiculous. It didn't look like To and McNabb in Pittsburgh in uh, you know 04, where they were trying to talk and go around each other. You know. It didn't look like that. And you know they're best friends, you know, and I've seen those guys out and they are besties, you know what I mean? So they're competitors and they're trying to win a football game and Nick Sirianni going in there to try to break it up, I think, I think it was nice, whatever. But when it comes to those two, I don't have a concern. I don't have a worry, not even a little bit. And you could see even during the game, and Seth Joyner pointed this out to me while we were watching the game in our green room last night. He said, like, look at this right here. You see Jalen Hurts going over. Jalen Hurts walked right over. To A.J. Brown, and it was after that situation on the sideline, and you could basically – Seth Joyner said, this next play is going to A.J. Brown, and I think the very next play was the 12-yard 12 12 yard reception to A.J. Brown. 
I don't think there's an issue there. I think in the moment, everyone wants to help everybody, and Jalen Hurts addressed that. I like that Nick Sirianni just basically left it to the players. He said, I, I don't even know what happened. And they said, well, the camera caught you going in and saying something. He's like, oh, yeah, I guess it did. And that was it. He wouldn't say anything. That's the right attacked by a head coach. When it came to Jalen Hurts after the game, he was cool as anything. Just look, everyone wants to help. Dallas Goddard didn't get his touches uh, in week one. Uh, A.J. Brown, a little lacking on touches in this particular game. We decided to run the football, and that's the way it's shaped up, unfortunately, for A.J. Brown. But I don't believe that there's any rift, any issue. I don't think there's going to be anything lingering. In the moment, I don't think that's a problem. The, m the bigger problem I have is that there'll be other people that will try to make a mountain out of a molehill when it comes to two guys trying to win a football game. Here, I, to me, I, I I tell people this, and if you know anything about uh, Italian women, like my wife here, um, you always understand one thing, okay? Uh. How you doing, honey? Is everything okay? <laughs> everything right? Y yes. Um, I have to go shopping. I have to buy some pottery pots. No problem, hon. I dropped one. I got it. Hey, look, we'll get another one. It's okay. It's my job to kind of calm the room down because – I, Mark, you're gonna you're gonna die. But yesterday, asked Tone. I said this: You watch that guy doesn't get enough targets. He's gonna start complaining on the sidelines. Sure enough, he did. And they were up ten. And I'm going like, <laughs> it, it's just it's the, it's the modern position today. He's a high energy guy. That's not To. That's not Alshon Jeffries whispering in corners. That's not any of that stuff. To me, it's competitive guys that I do believe also that we're just trying to win a game because, yeah. again, they know they need one another. And they're not going to not target A.J. Brown in games, even though the offense is limping right now. So I'm with you, dude. I don't, I, 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 I don't see anything, but you know what you're going to get? You're going to have people going like this uh, because they see all the Stephon Diggs and the Josh Allen stuff up in Buffalo. That's a completely different conversation. Diggs wants more personnel around him, and they need it. He's talking about, hey, I'm here to help you win also. So, I mean, it, it's funny how people could take that one little tiny anthill and just drop something on there and just turn it into a grenade. I, look, I, I I think a lot of Eagles fans, myself included, because, man, when T.O. came to town, I was a college kid at Temple University, and it was like, this is it. This is the man we've been waiting for. And then they, they roll through that season, and he gets hurt, but they still make the Super Bowl. And then it just blew up. We thought we were going to have this thing in Philadelphia for five, five, maybe five more years. Like, it was an incredible thing. And then it was two personalities that were great talent-wise, a perfect match talent-wise, but two personalities that just could not were not built for sustained success. But I think A.J. Brown and Jalen Hurts, they have both the personalities to get along for a long time. Obviously, personally, that's there. And then, as you said – when it comes to the game, they need each other to have success. And overall, having already been to a Super Bowl and having things not blow up, um, I'm pretty confident those two will be just fine and dandy going forward. How about this, Mark? I'm, I'm going to start naming DeAndre Swift Casper the Ghost. Now you see him, now you don't. <laughs> I mean, what he did last night, is this going to be something that solidifies his place now? Where See, I thought for sure them getting him in and him – them trying to figure – I still think they got to figure his place out in this offense to what, what his role is in this offense. And personally, I think that also could be playing into, Mark, the spreading out and the distributing of the football. I mean, you yeah. see the limited touches. You're also going like this. Well, we want to get Swift. He had 28 carries. He had the most touches of anybody in the ball game outside the quarterback, right? So maybe it really is more about defining the roles in these first two games. And we're kind of lucky it's the Patriots and the, the the Vikings. Two great D coordinators. Sure. Two great D coordinators, but Swiss roll. How do you see this thing going out, going forward here? Well, um, I think most people realized it was going to be, for the most part, a running back by committee. And Kenny Gainwell was going to get the first opportunity to be the hot hand. And you always ride the hot hand. There's no hotter hand right now in the NFL than DeAndre Swift. So coming out against the Buccaneers, there's no way Brian Johnson or Nick Sirianni can say, oh, well, Kenny Gainwell is going to get the first touch out of the backfield for the Eagles on Monday Night Football. Like hell he is. DeAndre Swift was exactly the running back you wanted to see him be when they traded for him. You wanted to see him be able to run the ball out of the backfield. You wanted to see him make a couple of catches, which he did in this game. He had two touches, Sills. He had two touches in week one. 
He gets 28 carries. He had 31 yeah. touches in all in this game. And every single one of them. I, I read a stat from Shil, Shil Kapati of um, uh, The Athletic that said efficiency, as far as run efficiency, this is the most efficient run game the Eagles had in 12 years. Wow. And that was insane to read that. And then I look at the reaction to Jordan Mailata in the locker room after the game. And they said, hey, what would you make of uh, DeAndre Swift? And he goes, honestly, I don't even know how many touches he had. I know he had a touchdown or how many yards he had. I know he had the 171. Holy bleep. And then they asked uh, Devontae Smith about it. And he goes, oh, yeah, he's a bad mother. You know, uh, he had a phenomenal game. There's no way the Eagles can deny him another opportunity to have that kind of success. Now, here's the thing. I almost hope he doesn't have the opportunity to have that much success again because that means that the Eagles are now terrified after this long layoff of what they're trying to do with Jalen Hurts or what Jalen Hurts is doing in this year after he looked like a perennial MVP quarterback. Now, I'm not at the panic button. No. I, don't even, I don't even have the glass off the panic button when it comes to that with Jalen Hurts. But if DeAndre Swift has to have another game like this, this means that you're not doing well as an offense in the passing game. And uh, my big thing is, and this was my issue in the first year as a starter with Jalen Hurts when he was running the football a lot, even more so than the, than the following season, is that it's never a good thing if you're a quarterback and they say, okay, we know, you know what we need from you? Less. Like, <laughs> you do less and then we'll be, we'll be better. All you got to do is be a game manager and we'll be just fine. And whenever we call on you to throw the ball, just don't throw an interception. That's not a good thing for a quarterback. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. Like I said, I am very optimistic. No, I, I don't want yeah. a Ferrari to drive like a VW. That's, that's <laughs> what I'm looking for, right? Exactly. Exactly. So I'm, I'm not wildly concerned. It's on my radar because you don't want to see him play the way he played in these first two games. And bottom line, look. You could say it's the offense. You could say it's the run game. You could say it's the offensive line, and all those things are true. You're two and zero, all right. Yeah, and like Nick, Sir, like Nick Sirianni said, it's better to be two and zero and have those mistakes to correct than zero and two and still be like, all right, well, what the hell are we going to do now? We can't. How are we going to correct this stuff? And we've already lost two games. Last question for you. Now, I, you've you've worked in that market for quite some time. And I'm going to give you what Angelo said about Sirianni, and I want to hear your take on him. Well, and I, I happen to agree with Angelo on this one. You know, he comes out after the um, New England game. He tries telling me how great Brian Johnson was as a play caller in that game. And I go, that's a bull-faced lie. Once again, falling on the sword for coaches. It's not going to cut it, especially in a city that you've worked in, Mark, that people know exactly when someone's BSing them. Angelo thinks that guy is a bookworm and he doesn't think really much of him because again, I mean, he's, this is how he show. And the great example of that is this, the special teams. I mean, and that new England game, Mark, I mean, you know, you're telling me Michael Clay's a good coach. Why is he still there? I mean, you have pre-snap penalties because you can't line up. Now I thought they were better last night a little bit, but, not by a ton, okay? But, I mean, give me your take on Sirianni because at times he looks like he's the perfect guy and the perfect fit. And at other times when I watch him when they really need to have a come-to-Jesus conversation with their coaches, I, I look at him and go, he's getting out coached." Yeah. Yeah. No, I, uh, I, I, I really like Nick Sirianni. I know this is going to come off bad, but – I always want coaches to be open and honest. I always want them to be transparent. I always want, as a fan, uh, for the fan base, I should say, I don't want a coach to ever, you know, what's the old expression? You know, pee on your shoes and tell you it's raining. Like, that, that's not you – don't, you don't want that. You want, well, that's you want, what he did after New England. Yeah, and he's done that before, and a lot of head coaches have done that. Andy Reid was the king of that. But ultimately, do you want – Michael Clay to be a better special teams coordinator? Do you want Brian Johnson to be a better offense coordinator? Because here's the alternative. Now, look, it's going to be easier to work for that guy when he's going to bat for you in the media and then in the meeting room, and I wouldn't put it past Nick Sirianni in the meeting room to be like, what the hell, guys? Like, you're going to leave me out to dry when it comes to this special teams unit? Brian Johnson, you're not going to get on the same page with your receivers and your quarterback? What the hell are we doing out there? You're the play caller. So if you want them to improve, you want to at least know that they're going to be working their asses off for a coach that's going to have their back. Now, I don't think that lasts forever. 
there's going to come a point if this does, if stuff does hit the fan, for instance, if they have this long layoff and then they come out Monday night against the Bucks and they look like they can't get on the same page again, then there's no hiding behind it. Then that conversation starts of, does Nick Sirianni need to take over play calling? My own personal opinion, that would be a very bad thing. However, if that's the best thing with Brian Johnson, Brian Johnson is terrible and he has failed miserably at being the offensive coordinator. If that's the case now, uh, I think this is going to be such a judgment game Monday night against the Bucs because you don't have the excuse anymore like, oh, there's rust. You don't have the excuse anymore. Oh, it's short rest. You don't have the excuse anymore. Oh, well, you know what? These, these guys have zero experience. You got two games under your belt as an offensive coordinator. Sean Desai, with his one year of experience as a defensive coordinator, is running circles around Brian Johnson as far as those training wheel coaches that you mentioned. But for me, I think it's all going to come down to this Monday night game against the Bucs where really people will really start to have that concern about Nick Sirianni, about Brian Johnson, and the future of this Eagles offense. Absolutely. Great stuff, Mark. Um, hey, tell folks where they can see you and your show. I watch it a lot. Thank you, brother. And I'm so happy that we connected here, man, because same thing with Anthony Gargano. I mean, I don't know, Anthony. We reached out to one another, and all of a sudden he's like, hey, hey. I go, listen, if you want to be <laughs> – if you're an Italian and you want to speak in a city, there's no other place in America <laughs> than in Philadelphia. If you're a Paisan, it's like Paisan Row. I'll make sure I tell Tony Bruno next hour high for you, too. Oh, yeah. One of the great legends, too, man. I, I love appreciate Tony. you doing this. You got to do it again, brother. I'd be my. It would be my absolute pleasure. I, I think, let's see here. I think Mike is Sicilian. Uh, I think Angelo is up Ruth Sace. I think Tony's Sicilian. I'm Colin. Yeah, my, my father's. Yeah. yeah, I think my, my, well, I don't think. My father's Calabrese. So okay. I, I'm glad to, I'm glad to represent the Calabrese uh, faction of the sports talking Italians up here in Philadelphia. Yeah, you know, <laughs> Sicilians and Calabrese, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of almost paisans. You yeah, know? <laughs> testadore, yeah, testadore. Hey, at least you're not Navi Don. You know, those guys Ooh. are friends. It's all good. <laughs> you said it. I did it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Great hanging with you, Sills. You bet, man. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it, my friend. See you, my friend. Mark Farzetta there. Don't forget, Tony Bruno will be with us also at 4.30 in hour number two. I want to get to some of the topics here now. Um, interesting, too, because, again, what you're going to get with this football team here now, he's right. you got 10 days to do something here. You know when those 10 days what you got a chance to do? you got a chance to correct some of the mistakes and maybe get a little bit healthy. Injuries are clearly a problem on this team now, especially on the defensive side of the ball. But I do want to ask this question. Why are the Eagles trying to make Jalen Hurts a drop back quarterback? He's not. He is a power running, throwing, unique quarterback. Can I tell you why I think Brian Johnson and the Eagle offense is struggling? Because they're trying to redefine the player. They are trying to redefine him. That's why when he goes out in the perimeter and runs, well, I think they are. That's why when he gets out in the perimeter and he's running, he's ducking. Because they're cognizant of that. They're concerned about his health out in the perimeter running. Okay? Let Jalen Cody be Jalen. I completely agree. I completely agree. Hey, I like I, I like Callie Green what he said. Hey, so you guys feel just as confident being 2 and 0 as you were 2 and 0 last year? How's that one for you? You feel as comfortable or less? Right now, Jalen is a awful passer. Awful. Batman. Hertz has been outplayed by two quarterbacks who would never be drafted in the first round if you were to put him in a draft today. <laughs> you would never. I feel Hertz needs to return to last year's passing form. Yeah, that's running the ball. 
And, 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 and by the way, this is why when Tone brought those statistics up, when Tone brought those statistics up about three dudes in your huddle last year, caught 67% of the footballs, made me think he's one read guy. I disagree with Mark. I think he is a one read guy. I think he's always been a one read guy. You know why? Because RPO is designed for one read guys. It's not designed for multiple progression reading quarterbacks. It's not designed for that. You think he sits back in the pocket the same way Josh Allen does and looks over or Burrow or any of those other guys? That's not who he is. Embrace it. You're fighting it. You want Jalen Hurts to be in the same conversation with all those quarterbacks, and he'll never. He's a unique one of. There's nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with team. Hey, do you know one of the worst, one of the most difficult teams to prepare for every year? One of the most difficult teams to prepare for every year is Navy. Why? Because they run the triple option and no one runs it. And no one prepares for it. It's the most, and that's why you always see Navy in games against really good teams. And you're like, they're one dimensional. They don't really do anything great, but no one sees that offense. You don't see it on a weekly basis. You just don't. H hard to prepare for Hurts. Hard to prepare for Hurts. Hey, JoJo goes, we're not 0 2. Boy, you sure sucked in your first two games. I'll tell you that. That's not a that's not a Super Bowl team. You are not a Super Bowl team right now. The 49ers and Cowboys are better than you in the NFC. Totally better. They're, they're, I mean, I don't know about you, but they're 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 out of the gate better. We'll see. Look, I'll tell you what, we'll we'll walk that back and we'll make that comment on Monday. The 49ers. If the, we'll walk that back, and I'll say this. Let's save that till Monday. Let's save that till Monday because I want to see uh, game two for the Cowboys and because I got to see Dak do more. Okay? I'm going to walk that back, and I'll, 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 I will. I'll walk that back because I want to see the 49ers and the Cowboys play this weekend because um, it's not fair to say that just after game one. They've only played one week. That's week two. But to me, I thought that performance last night, compared to the performance against New England, your pass defense is terrible still. It's not gotten any better, and it's getting worse. But the injury factor is playing um, a point in that. I don't think even when you get those healthy guys back, you're going to be better. Now, Bradbury, yes. When you get Bradbury back, yes, that'll be a huge, that'll be a huge improvement. Okay. Yes. That's right. Good thing the Super Bowl isn't now. Damn right. You're damn right. What did I say about the the running backs? Yeah. Rest of those dudes in your backfield are just dudes. Swift's the only guy we liked. And yet you de almost deactivated him in week one. <laughs> I mean. I'm not contradicting shit, dude. What are you talking about? Senor, anytime someone says that to me, you just listen to 2% of the shit that so you can plug into your own little feeble brain. So Avante Maddox, is it true? Torn Peck, he's out. No, I never said they're all dudes. That's not what I said. I said Swift. We like Swift. We said it the whole time. That's a lie. Tone's my producer. I said those other dudes are dudes. Swift is a guy you got to... But they treated Swift like a dude in game one. Okay. I want to talk about Jordan Davis. Look at these numbers here, too, for Jefferson. 11 catches, 159. Obviously, the fumble. 
Takes away that performance. Completely takes away that performance. Tony Bruno is going to join us in hour number two. Hey, don't forget, you know, I, I heard I heard people were just all over the place. Okay? All over the place at all seven of the locations with the Hooters folks. And we are so thankful for those folks going into the places. Go to northeasthooters.com to find a location nearest you. You enjoyed yourself. You had a great time. You watched the Eagles get a victory over the Minnesota Vikings. Some of you even went to hooters2go.com. You got the food. You brought it back to your crib. You had a great time. Do me a favor, though. Go into any one of the seven locations Tuesday. Buy 10 wings. Get 10 boneless free. Wing Wednesdays, a 40-year tradition. In the 40th anniversary of Hooters, the iconic Hooter girls are there for you to have a great time with and serve you the great food that they have on the menu. 1983, that's the year the place was founded. All you can eat. Kids eat for free on Saturdays. Go to northeasthooters.com to find one of the seven locations in the Northeast area, especially the King of Pressure one where we're going to be at. Do me a favor. Appreciate you guys doing all this for us. And when you go into Hooters, tell them Big Seal sent you.